Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome back to another workflow webinar uh, with Sure's market development team. Uh, I'm Jen. Jason is also here with me. Uh, in the background, we have a few people like Ryan Smith from our AR group and <coughs> Nicholas and Mark and Salino and Eric, uh, all for answering questions. If you noticed in your chat, those of you who are tuning in, uh, there's an area to throw questions, so please use that as we go through. Uh, we're doing something a little different uh, this Friday from a workflow standpoint. Uh, we thought we'd bring in a couple experts from our applications team. Uh, if you're not familiar with our applications team, they are the super pro users. <laughs> um, so when you call us and email us and you're trying to figure out like how to do your crazy coordination or your antenna design, uh, you're gonna get one of these fine gentlemen on the phone. Uh, so first of all, we have the illustrious Tim Veer. Uh, Tim Veer often teaches our advanced wireless training. So I think many of you know him or have possibly read some of his uh, publications on wireless. And then we also have Justin Bullier. So um, Justin, I don't actually know a huge amount, although he plays every instrument known to man from, <laughs> from what I can tell, because every time I see him in a band, he is playing something else. Something <laughs> so, different. so let's kick it off. Um, let's start with Justin. Justin, you <clears throat> want to tell us a little bit about your background and uh, how you came oh, sure. to be uh, one of our application specialists. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that was kind of a good introduction because it, it's a musical background. And uh, you know, I suppose it comes from a standpoint of, you know, here's a guitar and here's an amplifier and I want to make sound come out of one end to the other end. So which one do you plug into which other thing? And after years and years of playing around with that, you know, you start to learn a little bit more about how to get the right signal to come out. Um, one of our uh, one of one of our uh, explanations for things, you know, there's three conditions: it works, it doesn't work, it works, sounds funny. So I like to try to keep things in the uh, the A category there. It works and doesn't sound funny. So uh, yeah, I have a background in music, um, and then I came to Sure about 10 years ago, starting in customer service, and uh, I've been in applications now for six or seven years, and. Um, you know, those of you who are listening are probably pretty familiar with our department. We take emails, we take calls, we help <clears> with <throat> system designs, troubleshooting. So, uh, yeah, it's just been great to uh, be, you know, kind of in the thick of it and picking up a lot of knowledge along the way, working with great people like Tim and the rest of our department. And uh, I think between all of us, we've got, you know, something like uh, 80 or 90 years of experience. And uh, we found out a couple of weeks ago, between all of us, we own over 100 guitars. All right, that's a lot of guitars. <laughs> yeah. Nice. How big? How big is your team now? Uh, there are twelve of us. Over a hundred guitars of over twelve people. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and, and, and I think there are a couple that don't own any guitars. And a couple of those have no guitars. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go figure. <laughs> awesome. All right, Tim. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, how long is this webinar? Um. So I've, I've been with Sure for a number of years, and uh, I also came from a musical background, but unlike uh, Justin, I've never actually become very skilled at any instrument, but but I do flail away on a lot of them. Um, but uh, as probably he might have been uh, early on, in my early uh, rock and roll days, somebody had to be in charge of the sound system and the gear. And uh, I always had a, an interest in electronics and stuff like that. So that became me. And eventually my uh, hobby became my, my job here. Although uh, I did manage to complete uh, an aerospace engineering degree somewhere along the way. But um, uh, I've been uh, doing this uh, Applications engineering gig at Sure pretty much from the day I began, but also that's morphed into a lot of uh, training uh, over the years. So uh, it's been a great, great time here. Um, get to work with a bunch of great guys, as Justin pointed out. Um, and uh, and and Jen was kind of even in our neck of the woods or 
doing some of the stuff we were doing in terms of presentations uh, back in the day, but now out on the West Coast. So, uh, but as Justin pointed out, there's about a dozen of us. So you'll get uh, one or more of us if you call in with some kind of an issue and we're happy to help out over the phone. We also can do uh, remote desktop uh, interventions if you're working with some sure gear that's a network uh, based uh, product. Um, so we've uh, got a lot of ways now that we can uh, help out people in the field, uh, even remotely. So. Nice. All right. Well, the first question we have for you all is, um, is what is the most common wireless question that you get coming in? Like, what are, what are people kind of <clears throat> regularly calling about? Where are well, they stuck? Here, here's one, and it's kind of a basic question, but a lot of people want to know, and they're already using one mic, they want to know if they can use one more mic. And um, I guess, it, you know, as with everything in the audio industry, the answer is it depends. So are you using a dual channel receiver? But uh, yeah, we do spend a bit of time every week explaining that uh, each transmitter requires its own frequency, and most of our receivers only tune to one frequency at a time. So that's that's a pretty common one right off the bat. Yeah, the the uh, and and that uh, question often comes from probably the number one uh, wireless symptom that people call in about, which is dropouts. So when they when they lose the signal on their radio system, uh, that usually uh, generates a call to us, and uh, in some cases it is due to exactly what Justin. Uh, mentioned, which is they're trying to use multiple transmitters with a single receiver at the same time. That uh, clearly doesn't work. Uh, but then even when people are using a single uh, transmitter with a receiver, uh, inevitably there can be uh, loss of uh, signal. Um, and so a lot of what we do in the wireless side of things is investigating why they're having problems uh, getting a secure, you know, reliable signal to their receiver. And it may, uh, may be due to interference. Uh, it may be due to, uh, you know, poor frequency coordination. And uh, we'll go through a couple of those. Um, if I can, uh, could, could you bring up that first slide, uh, Jen? All right. I, I added some crude no logo slides here to keep keep me partly on track uh and and here here's um some observations that we always have to keep in mind when the call comes in or the email comes in whatever the the things that sure makes for 95 years now are not complete systems they are always part of some other system, which means they're always connected to some other device. Uh, about the only thing we might have made that was a complete system uh, back in the day, we did have a, a portable record player back in the 1960s, which was a self-contained thing and only needed to be plugged into AC power. But pretty much every other thing the company has ever made gets connected to something else. and in order to troubleshoot uh, our stuff uh, from whatever the problem is, we have to know what other things uh, the Sure product is connected to and, and how it's connected. And uh, these are the places where problems arise. So the, the three sort of scenarios I've illustrated down here is some Sure device connected to some other device, some Sure device which is connected to other devices, both on the input side and the output side, perhaps. And then some sure devices are just output devices uh, connected to some other thing. And those, uh, the boxes marked other device are uh, an unending number of things that people try to connect our products to. And the blue arrows are probably half of the problems, uh, the connection between our thing and their thing, uh, that is often the, the source of the problem. So as anybody out there who's been in the 
you know, the pro audio side of things for any length of time, you always have to keep in mind signal flow. Uh, our customers at, at a certain level, uh, certainly the entry level, do not comprehend signal flow. Uh, they have no idea what the signal is or which direction it's going from uh, in, what it's coming from, where it's going to. Uh, but any troubleshooting rests on the proposition of signal flow. It begins somewhere, it goes somewhere else, and if it doesn't get there or gets uh, changed in some fashion, that's that's what we need to find out. So um, many, many times uh, when somebody calls in, they call us because they found our name, S-H-U-R-E, on some piece of hardware that they have. It might be on a microphone, it might be on a mixer, uh, but but our name is on it somewhere. And because we answer the phone, they call us. Uh, but many, many, many times, uh, the issue is not actually with the Sure product, but in products it's connected to or how it's connected to those other products. And so we spend a significant amount of time troubleshooting things beyond the Sure product in order to uh, figure out uh, the source of, of the problem that they called us about, which is inevitably there's no sound or it sounds bad or something like that. Uh, and they found our name and they call us. So everybody in this department is amazingly versatile in knowing about how other products work and how things get connected to them. So we can actually follow the troubleshooting process uh, in many cases, well beyond the sure product that might be involved. Uh, once we decide that's not the problem, uh, we're pretty well equipped to help out quite beyond that. And then the company, to its credit, has always encouraged that uh, sort of effort. So, uh, you know, we're happy to, to go as far down these other rabbit holes as we can uh, if there's a sure product involved somewhere. You know, to that point, and I, I'm surprised I never got a call about this until a couple of weeks ago, but apparently there's another company named Sure, S-H-U-R-E, and they make drawers that you pass cash and documents underneath a bulletproof glass window. Uh, we unfortunately can't support that product. But, uh, uh, but it, as long as you've brought that up, because I'm really old and I know some of this stuff, uh, that company, the Sure Manufacturing Company, which is based in St. Louis, is a company that was founded by one of SN's brothers, uh, Samuel Joseph Schur. Founded the Schur Manufacturing Company in St. Louis uh, in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. And they make um, a variety of uh, industrial products, uh, shelving systems for warehouses that you stack pallets on. But they also make uh, these uh, stainless steel uh, teller drawers that you would find at banks and other places where you drive up and you'd put your deposit in the drawer, it slides in, uh, and it has the word sure on it. And and their logo was also kind of the semi-slanted sure logo uh, that our company uses. Uh, and the, the ultimate irony is that if you've been to any places that have these sure teller drawers that roll out at you, in many cases, there is a Shure 515 gooseneck microphone stuck on the other side of that glass window that the teller is talking to you through. So the teller's babbling to you through a Shure microphone and sending you your money in a Shure rollout drawer, and they are completely unrelated companies other than the founders being brothers, uh, you know, 80 years ago. So there you go. There's a blast of nothing. That's amazing. <laughs> Everybody learned something today, myself included. Is, um, is this what you else, tuned in for? Idea. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I enjoy history, so that's pretty fun. Um, so. You know, also to your point about sure devices versus other devices and <laughs> troubleshooting these things, uh, knowing something about signal flow sure, uh, surely goes a long way. And um, the indicator lights on our products and on other products are also very uh, useful to us. Like, what's this light doing? 
uh, what does the ready light on the Shure device look like, et cetera. So I'll leave that there and I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute too. Um, so uh, could I get the next slide, Jen? <clears throat> All right. So I, I vastly simplified the Shure equipment products into sort of three types of devices that fit into that previous uh, slide. So things that we make that are sources that produce some sort of output that have to be connected to some other device are our microphones, uh, wired microphones and wireless microphones. So those things can't operate by themselves. They must be connected to something else. And so when somebody isn't getting sound like they expect, they find our name on one of these two things and they call us up. And then it's up to us to figure out, is it our product or is it the thing it's connected to or is it the connection itself that may be the issue? The, uh, the second category of, of product are things that we make that are in the middle of these uh, audio signal chains. They can be mixers. Uh, we've got analog and digital mixers that we've produced over the years. Um, the thing in the middle, that hockey puck size thing is the one of our uh, audio to USB interface devices. So we've made those for a few years. Uh, and the thing on the right is a, a DSP that uh, functions as a digital mixer and uh, teleconferencing interface and so forth. So we have any of those types of products have something plugged into them and something on the output side. Uh, and in those cases, the troubleshooting is a little bit more complex because you've got two places where it's connected to something else, so two potential sources of problems on the input side, the output side. Uh, and then you've got to know something about whatever the source device is that's connected to this thing and whatever the the destination is that, uh, that it's connected to in turn. So this category of product uh, has its own set of uh troubleshooting procedures that we have to go through uh, and just to complicate things uh the products uh, that are shown here are all uh examples of hybrid products that is they have both analog inputs and outputs as well as digital inputs and outputs so these this class of product has uh, introduced us uh, willingly or unwillingly to the concept of network uh, digital audio um, transmission uh, as well as uh, you know USB digital audio and uh, other other types of, of digital audio uh, transmission and and processing uh, and then the the final category of product that uh, sure makes are our output devices and these would be earphones headphones they may be wireless things, they may be wired things, but uh, the company history is sort of founded on the input devices and the output devices, both of which are examples of transducers. So Shure's specialty or uh, sort of core business uh, since its founding really uh, was uh, transducer type thing. So microphones, phonograph cartridges, things on the input side that, that convert acoustic energy into electrical energy. And then uh, earphones, headphones, we've made loudspeakers from time to time uh, that turn that uh, electrical energy back into acoustic energy. Uh, and necessarily, we've also had to uh, produce products that are in the middle of all this stuff. So this this is kind of the the three categories of sure product that we have to support uh, and each has its own set of uh, idiosyncrasies in terms of what it's connected to how it's connected to all those things and and that kind of determines the troubleshooting process once we identify what the thing is any any comment on that justin <laughs> well i mean what you said about the uh you know the uh, digital realm i would i would comment that we spend maybe a little less time these days you know, asking if phantom power is turned on or, um, 
you know, dealing with the analog interfaces uh, as much. And uh, like you said, yeah, a lot more on the networking side of things and uh, maybe things about sample rates and whatnot. So it's a, you know, and it's an ever uh, an ever deepening can of worms that we, uh, <laughs> we that we uh, handle here. But y you mentioned a, a problem uh, that we still get on a regular basis. Um, I just had one last week, uh, having to do with uh, wired microphones, uh, because we make condenser microphones and dynamic microphones. Most of our condenser microphones require uh, phantom power. And uh, let's see, how can I say this diplomatically? Let's just say, uh, in recent months, many people uh, have found themselves uh, in a position where they need to set up some sort of remote sound equipment uh, for online presentations or distance learning or taking their aerobic classes outdoors or what have you. And so they're buying microphones, people that have never bought microphones in their lives, uh, and uh, trying to connect them to other things which, which they've also never bought in their lives. Uh, and uh, this phantom power question comes up. You know, all the pros out there, you understand what it is, and, and condensed mics, we turn it on. Uh, but uh, our entry level and, and newbie users don't have that concept. So we're, we still regularly field calls. I just bought this, this new uh, microphone, uh, and I plug it into my mixer, and it doesn't work. Uh, but I've got this other microphone, and it works fine. The, you know, the SM58 works fine, and the uh, the Beta 87 doesn't work at all. And the obvious answer is is the phantom power. Uh, but you have to explain this to folks. And in some cases, some of the equipment folks are buying uh, doesn't have phantom power available. Uh, and then you have to not only explain why it doesn't work but that they need to get some other piece of hardware to make this thing work. And uh, the, the trick is to give them this information diplomatically. Uh, and of course, it's always slightly embarrassing to admit that Sure doesn't make a phantom power supply. <laughs> you immediately have to go somewhere else to find another piece of hardware to make your thing work. Uh, but that's... Uh, that that's a problem that still comes up and and even more so these days when there's a lot of uh uh newly minted uh, home audio engineers trying to feel their way through all of this stuff i can mention the other one you said something about a wireless microphone and a we said something about a wireless receiver before oh, you're you're going to go there why don't you go there yeah i don't know if i was jumping the gun to bring this no no this already, is but... this is a good place for it you know, those of you who are familiar with our product line, you would know, you know maybe, the, maybe the QLXD24 SM58 wireless system. Which is BLX. illustrated right there. Hey, look at that. Yeah, it looks like a QLXD24 KSM9, which actually yes. is not bundled as a system. But one of the wireless systems that uh, uh, we apparently do make is called a VOG2 SM58 <laughs> system. And if you're familiar with our product line, you think, where is the 4 in this system? And why have I not heard of the VOG system before? That's the voice of God wireless mic. Uh, it operates on its own. You turn it on and the sound magically comes out of somewhere. And um, believe it or not, we actually do take a call once in a while where a person has neglected to uh, purchase a receiver or connect a receiver to anything. So kind of a joke we like to make, but um, yeah, kind of along with the question, you know, what else is in the rack? What's it connected to? What is the name on that other device? Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a fun one. Yes, and we appreciate uh, the internet because uh, as we ask folks, uh, what's this connected to? If they can deduce some sort of a make and model of the thing, we can quickly bring up some uh, online pictures of the inputs and outputs on that thing. And then we're able to hazard a, a more educated guess on what to connect it to, uh, how to select it, how to turn it on, and so forth. But uh, so that's useful, <laughs> but unfortunately necessary because 
again, folks who are not experienced are buying a bunch of gear uh, that they don't understand, trying to connect together. Uh, and again, because they found our name on one piece of it, we answer the phone. <laughs> we get to uh, help them set up their entire sound system. Uh, I had one. See, can I even go here now? Huh, sure, why not? Uh, I had an I will interesting. Point out, actually, hmm? before you, I definitely want to hear what you have to say. Asha <laughs> put in the comments that she loves the VOG 528. So, <laughs> so thank you, Justin, for bringing that up. Well, and, and one of the aggravating uh, factors in that is that if you go to Amazon, where people are apparently trying to buy everything, you can buy an individual transmitter. And it says, wireless SM58, okay, I got that. And, and you can buy individual receivers uh, or you can buy a system, but if you're looking for the cheapest thing, it's just the transmitter. Uh, and only later on do you find out you need the other part. Uh, or even so, a headset mic. Or a headset mic, right. Um, so uh, we're, we're doing a lot of kind of basic training these days in the last several months for the uh, large number of people that are uh, kind of forced to get into uh, learning something about audio and, and sound and so forth, um, which Did we're that? happy to do. Yeah, uh, I was going to say the same thing. We're happy to help. <laughs> Um, you know, they've gone to the trouble to buy uh, a sure product, uh, and it obviously relies on some other product. Uh, we'll do what we can to make sure that the two things work together. But I'll, I'll, I'll relate this one story from a, really only about a week ago. Uh, a, an installation that involved a whole raft of sure product, a bunch of sure wireless systems. Uh, a Shure conference system with its own microphones and, and so forth. Uh, a couple of SCM820 digital mixers like the ones illustrated there on this slide. Uh, and all of this stuff was connected to multiple destinations within this facility, a uh, audio video production room, an assistive listening uh, system, um, uh, couple of different PA systems, a recording system. So they had all of the wireless mics connected to uh, the digital mixers. Uh, and, and the complaint was, we're not getting sound from the wireless microphones. Okay, typical opening salvo. Uh, we got a wireless microphone, we're not getting sound from it. All right, uh, first thing, you find out what's what's the model of the microphone. Okay, it's this thing. All right, now I know what that should look like. Is the receiver on? Yep, transmitter's on. You're seeing RF on the receiver. Yep, uh, audio meter's going up now. Okay, that's good. So it sounds like the wireless system's working. What's it connected to? Oh, these digital mixers. Ah, okay. Uh, and they were even able to go into the uh, computer-based GUI on these digital mixers, and, and these things are like a couple of thousand dollars a piece, all right? Uh, so they got their computer hooked up, they're looking at the, the interface on their computer of the wireless microphones, and clearly there's audio coming into these things. Uh, and we look at the output uh, screen, uh, there's audio going out of this thing. And uh, okay, that, that's all good. Uh, and now these various destinations, yes, we're getting it, the assistive listening device, you're seeing the meters go up and down in that thing. They're getting in the production studio, coming into their facility. They can use it for recording and so forth. But we're we're not hearing it um, in the uh, in the main uh, meeting room here. Okay, so this must be connected to a, a power amplifier, yes, with loudspeakers attached, presumably. So after some searching around. Uh, we were able to deduce that, uh, oh, here's the power amp that's running the loudspeakers uh, in this room. And it looks like everything's connected okay. Uh, and I'm looking at a picture of this power amplifier on online. I say, now, the right-hand side of the front panel, there's a little push button uh, that should be blue with a little light when it's on. Uh, is that lit up? About five seconds of silence at the other end of the phone. 
Uh, hmm. Oh, well, I, I just pushed that button and now we hear sound. So th this process probably took close to a half an hour to get through this fairly complex set of gear and, and, you know, all high quality professional stuff and everything was working all the way down the line. But this particular person didn't know that the power amplifier wasn't turned on. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the first 10 minutes of the call were troubleshooting the Shure equipment. <laughs> the next 20 minutes was figuring out why they couldn't hear it. Uh, and, and unfortunately, this is not unusual. But again, as Justin says, we're, we're happy to do this. Uh, in this case, there was certainly a lot of our product involved, uh, so it's fine. But this is not an unusual situation by by any means. You know, I would say that one thing that was very helpful in that instance is that the person was on site and uh, uh, was able to access the equipment while they called to troubleshoot it. Uh, yes, this is another thing that's sometimes overlooked. Um, while I'm in the car right now, I don't I don't have the receiver in front of me. Like, mm, okay. Uh, yes. So, so when you get there, look for the ready light. Yeah. All bad. right. So given that, what would you like folks to? Is there a checklist? Uh, of yes. So information if you go, that you would like folks to have before they call if, you. If you can go to the next slide. All right. So the. The first thing we always try to do uh, is what is the sure product that they're using? Uh, you know, microphone, wireless mic, whatever. Uh, and I didn't expand this slide, so I'll just have to kind of do it verbally here. If it's a uh, wired microphone, we can quickly figure out uh, it's a dynamic or a condenser. It, needs phantom power or not, we can get through that pretty quickly. If it's a wireless product, we need to know the model number of this thing uh, because our microphones operate in different radio frequency ranges. They operate in different ways. So the very first thing you need is the model number of the device. And the next thing you need to know is the frequency band of that device. So most of our wireless systems uh, can operate in multiple frequency bands, but specific frequency band is required to match between the transmitter and receiver. Uh, and it's and when I go through this uh, questioning process of people on the phone, uh, they'll say, you know, I've got I've got your SM58 wireless mic. Great. That narrows it down to about 50 different things. Uh, Okay, it, it's, yes, it says SM58 up at the top. Open the battery compartment. What does it say inside? Oh, it's a PGX2 or something like LX2. that. LX2. An, an LX2. Don't don't laugh. I had one last week. I had no, one yesterday. <laughs> actually, a T, it was a T2 uh, fixed frequency VHF system from 25 years ago. But um, so they identify the thing, and then we... I have to have them hunt around the label to find the frequency band. And then we have to make sure that the frequency band on the receiver matches the transmitter. Uh, and you know, a lot of folks have mixed inventory. They've got systems in different frequency bands. And I, I, a common problem is somebody's trying to sync up a microphone in one frequency band with a, trans, uh, a receiver in a different frequency band. Uh, this, this is pretty, pretty common. Uh, so we quickly get through the frequency band, the model number, and then the, the last part of it, really, or second to last, is where are they? Where are you? Uh, and that means a city and state or a zip code, because if it is a UHF system or a VHF system, we need to know whether there's a possibility of television uh, signal interference. So, so those those are the main things we know need the the model number the frequency band and and where they are from from that information we can determine whether there's any uh likelihood of uh television signal interference uh and also 
whether they've got a matched set of stuff that could even work in the first place. Uh, the, 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 the one remaining thing on the wireless side of things, and which is the, the can of worms question is, do you have any other wireless systems at that location? And if the answer is yes, then we need a complete inventory of everything they've got that's a radio system. And, uh, and this, oh yes, we've got uh, two ULXPs and a QLXD and uh, an old PGXD. Okay, that's good. You're writing all this down. Uh, do you have any uh, in-ear monitor systems? Oh yeah, we've got uh, uh, three uh, PSM 300s. Um, okay, that's great. Um, any, anything else? Any other wireless mics? Oh, we've got uh, we've got a couple of Sennheiser wireless mics and a, a couple of Audio Technica wireless microphones, but they don't use the same frequencies that you use, do they? Eh. <laughs> uh, no, uh, they all use the same frequency. So I I there is still a, a somewhat common misconception uh, in part of the public that. Noor has its own set of frequencies, and Sennheiser has its set of frequencies, and AT has their set of frequencies, and they never talk to each other. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. So once we've dragged out the complete inventory that's at this location, then we have to go uh, through a complete uh, frequency coordination process uh, to make sure that there's not any TV stuff, not any mutual interference between the devices. And in many cases, as Justin pointed out, earlier, we can use the meters and the displays on these receivers to kind of suss out whether there's an interference issue. Uh, you know, you turn all the transmitters off, any of the receivers still lit up, oop, not good. Uh, but the uh, you know, less expensive receivers don't have those indicators. So it's a little bit more difficult uh, in some cases to determine whether it's an, an interference problem or, or not. Uh, but those are the things that need the most amount of information is wireless systems when, when somebody calls up. We need all that ancillary stuff to really get a good uh, handle on what the problem might be. Anything to add, Justin? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the wireless systems, you know, multiple systems being used, sometimes multiple systems getting mixed up. I mean, we mentioned earlier about people buying things online, which is fine, but, you know, you, sometimes overlook the fact the H9 receiver has to match an H9 transmitter, so they've got the wrong one. Or another kind of common thing is, uh, and, and, and also kind of along the lines of what Tim was saying, you know, do you have any other manufacturers of mics? Do you have in-ear systems? Do you have assisted listening systems? Okay, we've taken all that down. Oh, but wait, there's a, we have our fellowship hall and a youth room, you know, down the hall, and they're each using 12 channels of wireless, so uh, yes. that has to be considered, of course. And then another thing is, oh yeah, we had our, uh, you know, our pageant or we had our concert a couple of weeks ago and we got all of our mics. Did the right mics get back to the right locations? So I'm um, talking to a school teacher who's uh, trying to operate their mic in the gym and they turn out to be using the choir teacher's mic that was misplaced or didn't go back to the, didn't go back to its home after the, after the big concert. So uh, it's, uh, it's actually a lot of fun. You know, it's, uh, it's enjoyable in a lot of cases. You know, trying yeah. to figure out what is the missing piece here. Or, you know, it, it's uh, it's an intellectual exercise. Some products more than others. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but out of out of curiosity, since things have been really moving digital these days. Yes. How have the questions changed? Are there any things network wise that you would recommend or want people to know about um, as they're you know, troubleshooting on their own or before they call in? Like, what are you seeing from a network standpoint? Okay, I'll, I'll go there. Okay. Uh, so on, on this same slide, if we've identified some uh, devices uh, or the Sure product itself, which communicates in some digital fashion, uh, either Dante or AES67 or even just USB or something like that, uh, that brings up a, uh, a whole new realm of connectivity issues. Uh, for folks who are uh, kind of listening in that are familiar with, with Dante, 
uh, and other digital uh, audio network uh, protocols, uh, you now have to have some chops, some network chops, uh, in order to use uh, this type of audio gear. Uh, and as in the case of uh, all Sure product, uh, we are dependent at that point not just on the, the connecting cable from our piece to another piece, but in most cases, there's a network switch involved uh, for any kind of uh, digital audio network product. And the configuration of network switches is a science uh, and uh, to some extent uh, voodoo uh, process to get some of these larger complex systems to work. Uh, each of the digital audio protocols, Dante, for example, has certain requirements for the ethernet switches that must be satisfied. Uh, you need to uh, make sure there's no energy efficient ethernet going on. You need to handle multicast uh, traffic on the switches properly in order that the, the clock timing uh, between Dante devices uh, is there, and so they have a stable clock master and so forth. Uh, and we spend uh, many, many hours going through network configuration of our product. And in the vast majority of cases where, quote, the Sure product isn't working, uh, meaning audio from the Sure product is not getting to some other part of the system, uh, the Sure product is not actually the problem. The problem is in the network. And in, in the again, majority of cases, it's the configuration of the network switches. And I'll have to say something here, and I'll try to be diplomatic. Uh, uh, let's see. We're, uh, okay, I'll say, I'll say two things. The, the first thing is that there has been a convergence of uh, audiovisual uh, operation and equipment and so forth with uh, IT uh, equipment and operation. Uh, there used to be AV experts and IT experts. In many cases now, especially in the corporate world and even the educational world, the IT departments are becoming the AV departments. And this uh, brings up the unanswerable question. I'm sure you each have an answer. The question is, is it easier to teach an audio guy or person about uh, network stuff and get a good result? Or is it easier to teach a network person something about audio visual stuff and get a good result? Uh, the, the jury is still out on the answer to that question. My, my personal belief is that competent AV people can learn networking uh, well enough to do what they need to do. Uh, I'm not sure that the converse is true, uh, but um, it is the case that in many places, the folks we're talking to in the other end of the line are not AV people. They're actually network people, and network people have a completely different philosophy about uh, networks than audio folks, and, and where you run into the big problem is that the number one, and in fact, only, literally, the only priority of IT people is network security. They literally have no other job. Their job is network security, period. And everything else uh, falls below that. Uh, and it is the case that uh, certain network security protocols are extremely hostile to certain network audio functions. Uh, and so there is a, I, I won't call it a battle, I'll call it a conversation between uh, network AV people and uh, the network IT people. Uh, and most integrators, installers, if they can possibly do it, will isolate their AV networks from the corporate networks that may be in the same facility. Uh, but unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, a lot of corporate uh, institutions 
insist that any network that exists in their facility be somehow connected to their corporate network. And, and this is where things get really, really messy. Uh, and I can't tell you how much time we spend sorting out this sort of thing, which ultimately has nothing to do with the Sure products uh, and, and frankly doesn't have anything to do with the stuff it's connected to, uh, the, the biop to Cirrus and the QSC cores and all the rest of this stuff. But it has everything to do with the network that's in between. Um, and uh, we've got people in our department who are Cisco certified network engineers uh, who really handle the, the worst cases of this. But uh, I have seen these folks spend literally hours uh, trying to sort out network problems uh, that are mostly due to the way these things are configured for security purposes within the corporate facility. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that with a, a note from Tom Figley. Anybody remembers Tom Figley? Yep. Uh, typically after about two hours working on one of these things, where we're, we're now down to reconfiguring the layer three multicast traffic in the switch, uh, I'll, I'll have to be reminded of Tom Figley's comment in the middle of a difficult afternoon years ago when he said, if this was analog, we'd be done by now. And I, I have to agree. Uh, and yet there's no going back. Uh, the industry is, is fully engaged with digital and it's fun, especially when it works, but it is a challenge. Uh, and uh, a lot of our staff now is dealing with those challenges. It's, it's long beyond is the phantom power switched on or not. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but we still answer those questions too. Um, we've got 95 years worth of product we have to support out there. So we, we can do it. All right, so I'd like to talk about uh, some of the more creative and interesting things that you've encountered. Oh, you're gonna go there? I, I feel like we need to. <laughs> All right, this okay, the, so. Hall of Shame. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure many. Uh, yeah. uh, we'll we'll call that creativity. Create. Yeah, I, I like it. I like it. In, ingenuity in the field. Yeah. Uh, so. so we we know that uh, you know microphones are, are pretty straightforward. You just talk into one end, you plug the other end in. Uh, wireless microphones uh, are a little bit more complex, and probably the most complex part of a wireless for the typical users how to deal with antennas uh, because we don't have intuitive understanding of radio. We don't have an intuitive and uh, feel for uh, antennas and where to put them, how to, how to place them and orient them and connect them and all that stuff. And so that's probably the place we see the most creativity in the field is with uh, antenna setups. Uh, and, and as you would know, the antenna setup can make or break whether the wireless system is going to work or not. So I have a few examples because uh, a, a picture of a badly configured Cisco switch is not very entertaining. But but pictures of badly configured antennas I find to be quite entertaining. So let's see if I can bring up. Uh, what do we see here? We seeing anything here? Yes. Uh, is this the uh, antenna paddle picture? This is the antenna paddle. It looks like a medieval frightened. Yeah, it's like a morning frighten. star or something. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So uh, I, I hope I hope some people I hope most people find this amusing and 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 not say oh that looks like a good idea. But I, it I would say you know just in in the. Uh, um, <laughs> You know, to, to praise something that this setup is accomplishing is that uh, the quarter wavelength antennas have found themselves on a metal ground plane here. Yes. So that's good. That's good. Uh, and and they've connected everything by, it looks like about uh, 25 coax cables, probably 24, it must be an even number. Um, and it does get the antennas up uh, in a kind of a line of sight condition to where the transmitters are gonna be. So they've but accomplished this is, that um, too, that's good. 
it it violates a little bit of uh, um, antenna to antenna spacing, which we suggest should be at least a quarter wavelength, which is the length of these antennas. So this collection of antennas should really be about six feet across instead of four inches across. So that this was a, a, a creative solution. Um, and and still, the amount of time it took to cut all those holes into those metal panels and mount all that stuff with those cables probably was comparable to getting an antenna distribution amplifier, but I don't know. So here's one. Um, again, uh, the spacing between antennas we prefer should be at least a quarter wavelength or so. Uh, but we do like the antennas are kind of arranged in a rabbit ear fashion because that kind of splits the difference on polarization angle. But this is probably not the ideal way to get your sets of antennas oriented in the right direction by gaff taping them together. Yes, it works. And if this is the only compromise you've made, it'll work fine. But I, I just couldn't resist taking a picture of that. Uh, here's another one. Uh, now, it is certainly possible to attach a pair of antennas to each uh, receiver, uh, if you'd like. Um, <clears throat> but there are more cost-effective ways to, to do this uh, using uh, antenna distribution. Uh, so we appreciate that somebody spent one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like 10. We appreciate that somebody spent about uh, almost $4,000 on all of these uh, high gain uh, directional antennas. Uh, but if they had put up one pair of antennas and got a couple of distros, I, I think things would have been a little bit simpler. But again, yeah, it's expensive. It, it's th this is actually not an efficient way to do this. Looks cool. Yes. <clears throat> and I thought I had one more here. Oh, this one. Um, yeah, this, uh, this has uh, kind of the antennas stuck down alongside the metal rack. They're too close to the, to the metal rack. Uh, so that's going to uh, detune these antennas somewhat. They should be kind of rotated so they're up in the air. Don't know if I had a picture of the, uh, oh, here's one. This is a, a, a fairly typical wireless rig that you get when you accumulate wireless systems over the course of many years. Uh, you just kind of stack them up on top of each other. Um, what's a little bit disconcerting, uh, can you see a mouse rolling around here? Yes. A cursor? Okay. So these things in here are uh, PSM 200 in-ear monitor transmitters, I believe. So the, these PSM are the transmitter antennas. I think that's, is that what those are? I don't know, I just see a single half-wave antenna back there too, so. Back here? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the, sorry. the short <laughs> quarter waves are on the front panels of these devices. Can you see those? Yep. Look at, yep. So, that, that's a bunch of in-ear monitor transmit antennas. They're quite close to some wireless microphone receive uh, antennas, which is not a good thing because the high power of the uh, in-ear monitor transmitters uh, quite close to the, in -ear, to the wireless mic receive antennas can overload those receivers and desensitize them. So you always want to isolate transmit antennas away from receive antennas. Uh, at least they have them up on a shelf, they're kind of out in the open, so that's that's okay. And none of the systems they have here, the possible exception of this LX device, which is a VHF rig, uh, they don't really have detachable antennas, so you can't really use uh, antenna distro very easily with these sorts of things. But it's not uncommon to see a rig like that that gets accumulated uh, over time 
Um, this so was what would a the solution. Hmm? Be different shelves, space it out, basically. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So this uh, this didn't look too bad, but the the red circle here uh, is around a uh, speaker grill, and it's actually a, a metal a mesh grill behind there and the antenna is in there uh which effectively places the antenna uh, behind a, a metal wall because uh, as you would know if the wavelength of the radio signal is large uh compared to the openings of a, a metal uh grid in front of it uh the radio waves won't go through the grid so even though sound waves can pass through a metal grid like this uh radio waves uh, cannot because the grid spacing is too close so you, you can't really hide an antenna behind some sort of a metal uh mesh grid like that um, this is this is something that's great for uh heating up food in a microwave but doesn't work well for wireless microphones uh correct uh it the, that grid the the small hole grid in your microwave oven keeps the microwaves inside uh, uh which is good uh but you don't want to put your transmit antennas through there i can't see Was there, uh, this is just another uh quarter wave rack yes. again uh, these are receivers that uh, don't have detachable antennas so you can't really use uh antenna distribution but uh this is not an ideal situation because the Proximity of the antennas to each other detunes them a little bit. It, it's not fatal by itself, but it's it's not the preferred way to do this. So uh, these are just kind of a few examples of some creative uh, antenna uh, solutions uh, that we see in the field. Um, and I'm sure some of you have seen things equally entertaining uh, over the years. Okay, I'll. Uh, Justin, what do you think your most creative phone call has been? Uh, I've, I've had a couple of good ones. I would say uh, one I wanted to point out in this discussion is uh, concerning a uh, antenna distribution system. So these usually have four outputs or five sets of outputs on them. And I think this installer was using two or three out of the five outputs. And then uh, I think they were kind of... Uh, uh, carryover from the ham radio world and, you know, kind of a broadcast engineer and, and conventional wisdom was that if you had unused outputs, you had to terminate them with something. And so they had a bunch of uh, extra quarter wavelength antennas lying around because they were doing remote antennas. So they terminated all the extra outputs behind the rack with antennas. And so now we, uh, after, and this is also after about 20 or 30 minutes of troubleshooting, that we found out that they've got a, a host of antennas plugged in that are transmitting right on top of the other receiver antennas. So that was kind of a fun one. And, uh, or, you know, we even get situations where uh, it's unknown where the antennas are placed or uh, it's kind of akin to, uh, there's a panel on the wall with an XLR jack and we're tracing down a hum issue. Well, we don't know what kind of cable is hooked up or how it was hooked up or what it's connected to. So sometimes we have uh, some unknown things that uh, uh, it would be helpful to uh, find out more about. Right on. All right, well, we have a couple support questions that came in through our questions area. So I'm gonna throw those out at you. Uh, Benjamin asks, can I use a KSM-141 or a KSM-137 with any of the Sure Body Pack transmitters? Application is a choir mic. Uh, wireless situation. choir mic. Uh, yeah. the, the, the short answer is sort of. Uh, the shortest answer is no, but the longer answer is yes, if you have a phantom power supply that you can insert between the microphone and the input to the body pack transmitter. Uh, having said that, <clears throat> uh, a AD3? AD3. Okay, the AD3 exists now or soon or something? I can talk about it that on our now. website. All right. Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> so the AD3 is a plug-on transmitter. Oh, man. How come these it's guys have these and I don't? But that, that oh, 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 wait. 
<laughs> I'm muted. Oh, now I'm not. The unicorn. This is bad. <laughs> You've all got them. There it is. It, it exists as of Monday. I've never even seen oh, them. Sam's got one too. <laughs> oh Fantastic. God. Get the whole crew. Oh, <laughs> but they tell me that you can plug this thing on the end of a microphone, as illustrated there, uh, and it has phantom power. So you could use this with a, a wireless choir microphone. So, so now the short answer is yes. <laughs> or there you go. <laughs> wow, a five sixty five. Cool. Yeah. It's my favorite. I love it. <laughs> can we get a Chrome AD three to go with it? There you go. Um. And then, you know, there, there, there also, uh, there used to be some uh, battery powered condenser mics. That would be the other exception to that. Um, yeah. you know, unfortunately, yeah. not the 141 or the 137, but if you have a SM94 lying around, uh, PG81, wow. those were also battery operated mics. All right, perfect. All right, another question from Benjamin. Suppose I have a BLX wireless system with 12 compatible systems and having used tw the 12 systems is there any way to increase or add more of the blx system or do i need to look at some other brand or product series <clears throat> uh I'll, I'll take it okay uh i believe we claim uh you could use up to 12 blx systems in a single frequency band if there's no television channels on the air in that band. But <clears throat> that does not preclude using additional BLX systems in a different frequency band. The uh, difficulty uh, is that uh, when you introduce multiple frequency bands, even of the same type of product, you have to use wireless workbench uh, in order to calculate a compatible set of frequencies. Uh, but uh, depending on <clears throat> whether all those systems are going to be in the same a room or not, you can uh, manipulate the wireless workbench program uh, to give you um, larger numbers of systems than you would expect from our uh, 12 per band limit. Uh, I had a case uh, just yesterday uh, where somebody needed uh, 22 BLX systems uh, in a school, and this is actually going on a lot right now. They're putting one wireless system into each room, each classroom of a school. Uh, I had another one a couple of weeks ago for about 50 some odd systems. And the wireless workbench program doesn't allow you to put up that many BLX systems uh, if it assumes they're all in the same spot. But it's very uh, easy to uh, go into the workbench program and you don't even have to go into the uh, the, the trouble of changing each microphone to its own zone, which is a good way. Uh, but since they're individual, there's no more than one in each room. There won't be any intermodulation uh, between any of these systems. So you can just go into the wireless workbench program, turn off all the intermod uh, checkboxes, and calculate a set of frequencies for whatever you need, just based on uh, the channel spacing. So you've got a safe set of systems. There won't be any crosstalk or any interference between them as long as they each stay in their own uh, separate room. And you can get very large numbers of systems in that fashion. Uh, but you, you do need wireless workbench to calculate that for you. Perfect. All right. Uh, Nathan asks, how many transmitters should you put on a helical antenna as for the application of wireless in-ears? Um, there's no there's no limit to the number of transmitters that can be connected to a transmit antenna. Uh, the antenna as a passive device doesn't have a, a power limit, if you will. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. It doesn't have a power limit that you could exceed with inner monitor transmitters. Uh, the helical antenna would probably not be happy if you tried to deliver a uh, thousand watts to it. Uh, it would probably overheat and become unpleasant, but uh, intermonitor transmitters typically 100 milliwatts max. Uh, so you could have uh, 
10 of those gives you a watt, uh, you know, and a power level is probably less than 100 watts. Uh, that uh, antenna isn't going to have any problem uh, handling that, that kind of power. All right. The, the limit's more in the combiner. That's, that's where you're going to run out of gas. Gotcha. All right, perfect. Um, all right, let's. There's an Axiom Digital question that just came in from David. I have two AD4D with two AD1 sticks. Sometimes when powering off the mic, it will cause interference on the receiver. The light turns red on the receiver. It only happens sometimes. Gain on the mic is zero. No pad. High power. High power on the mic. Um, plus zero gain on the active paddles and the paddles are spaced several feet apart why might this be happening uh it, it's a rf overload that he's seeing i think so it, he says interference but i'm guessing ah. it's uh but it might be an rf overload okay well if if he gets an interference message from the uh receiver It'll, it'll flash, you know, interference detector or something like that. It could be uh, a brief uh, overload of the receiver if that transmitter is uh, relatively close to one of the receive antennas. Uh, the, uh, the red overload indicators on an AD receiver will light up when the RF level is about uh, minus 20 dBm, I believe. Uh, so if you're quite close to a, a receiver uh, antenna and you turn on a transmitter, uh, it may very well show a, a, an RF overload until you move the transmitter away or, or lower the power. It's not going to hurt anything, but it does engage a, a, an RF attenuator on that uh, channel. If, if it detects that overload, it's going to put in an attenuator to keep it from causing a problem. Uh, but an an overload could be detected as an interfering signal. I'd, I'd have to look at the particulars to see exactly what's going on with that. Okay, perfect. Uh, David messaged back that he's he was very close to the paddles when he was turning on and off, so it does sound yeah. Yeah. like that it was probably the overload. And, right and on. For, fortunately, almost everything that we make now that has an active RF section in it has an overload indicator. So the UA874 antenna has an overload indicator. The UA834 amplifiers have overload indicators. The receivers have overload indicators. The distros have overload indicators. Uh, so almost anywhere down the line where there's some RF gain, there's an overload indicator to tell you if you're getting out of control. All right, perfect. Uh, one last question. Uh, Marvin says, Justin sounds good. What is he using on this <laughs> webinar? <laughs> um, well, the microphone is the vintage Sonodyne 51, which uh, looks an awful lot like the current model MV51. And actually along those lines, um, aha, look at that. And the I have one of those. Panel. Say again? I have one of those. There you go. Um, so yeah, we uh, borrowed the uh, aesthetic design from from this mic, um, and then I have this plugged into an MV uh, MVI interface, which uh, looks like Tim's reaching for that. So here's the MVI, and, uh, and that'll work with uh, just about any microphone with its XLR input combo, quarter inch input, and the ability to supply phantom power. Nice, Tim. What are you using? I'm using an MV5 uh, on the end of this boom with a clever uh, Roland uh, adapter that allows me to thread the microphone onto it, um, running into my computer. Um, but I also have uh, the MVI that I use sometimes, a, uh, a variety of interfaces, uh, the X2U. Uh, oh my. I, I often use this thing. Yeah. Uh, with an SM58. Uh, the main disadvantage of this mic is it doesn't have a very good blast filter. It has no blast filter. Um, but uh, that that's that's what I'm using. All right. 
Perfect. Looks like, looks like you're off axis to avoid those pops. Uh, yeah, that's. I'm trying to talk across it so I don't get right too on. many pops in there. Um, All right. Final question for the both of you that we ask uh, our panelists on all of these webinars. What is your favorite Sure product and why? Oh, wow. <laughs> I know I didn't tell you about that one ahead of time. It's more fun to get a. You know, this, this has come up in other webinars, though, and I should have thought to uh, collect a few of my, my Sure mics from downstairs. But. I love the Beta 181. I think it's such a cool little mic. It sounds incredible. Uh, it's very light, very small, so it doesn't make your mic stand fall over if you put it out in front of, you know, on top of a drum set or something. And uh, yeah, I just think that's a killer mic, the Beta 181. That, that's a nice microphone. All um, right, Tim, my, for you? My favorite Sure microphone in terms of just all around great operation is probably still the uh, the SM81. Uh, but my favorite Shure product uh, is still the Shure Vocal Master. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Awesome. That was my first PA system. Was it really? Oh, That's yeah. so great. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I want to say our time flew by. We're actually about 15 over. So Oops. thank you so much. No, it's good. We we do this all the time. Uh, thank you, Justin and Tim, uh, sure. for joining us on the webinar. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, I think that most of you know that we have our Pro Tech Talk every first and third Tuesday of the month. Uh, we just had one this week, so we're off next week, uh, but then join us again. This is an hour where you can just join us and ask uh, ask us any uh, tech support question you want to. We should maybe have Tim and Justin join us on, on that one of these days. Um, and then next week, Friday, uh, we're pretty excited about this one. Uh, so I think most of you probably have heard of the Grand Old Opry. It's a pretty historic uh, venue down in Nashville. Uh, they've actually been doing streaming since all the COVID shelter in place situation. And we have Bob Bouchier who will be joining us. He's the monitor engineer over there. Um, and he's gonna give us a rig rundown of what they have going over at the Opry and doing some Q and A for us. So, um, so yeah, we're pretty excited. It's a kind of magical, amazing venue if you've never been. So uh, do join us next week uh, to check that out. So, and with that, uh, that would be the end of our webinar for, for today. Thank you all very much for joining us. Justin and Tim, thank you for taking some time out of your day uh, to join us for this. And uh, we'll see you all next week, Friday. Cool. Bye, everybody. All right. Thanks, Jen. Have a great weekend.